Sarah, you're going to keep on keep on keeping on with us because we are about to start our student showcase. Would you like to turn it over and introduce our, our special student guest tonight? Sure. Um, so here at the Bell Museum, we are very lucky to be able to have undergraduate students work with us and they come from majors all over campus. Um, and so tonight we have two of our planetarium staff, Meredith Weber and then Andrew Ser Serene. They're going to share with us some of the really cool projects they get to do as undergraduates here at the U and kind of a little bit more about themselves and, and how astronomy is just more than just the constellations we see in the sky. So I'm actually going to go ahead and turn it over to Meredith first and she's going to kick us off with what really cool stuff she's been working on recently. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Um, and thank you, Jerry. That was a great presentation. I also did not know about those smaller um, asterisms within different constellations. Okay, so um, my name is Meredith Weber and I am a fourth year physics and um, astrophysics student here at the U of M. I also give planetarium shows at the Bell Museum, so you may have seen me there. Um, and today I'm going to talk about my internship with NASA that I had in this past spring semester, as well as how I got there and kind of a little bit more about my journey in academia thus far. So a little bit of overview on my talk, I'll give some background, like I said, um, some projects I've worked on, how did I apply to NASA, and then go into my NASA project itself. So I get this question a lot, why did I choose astrophysics? Um, and one of the biggest things I can say is my dad is a physics teacher at my hometown high school. And so he was my physics teacher. Um, he's also a hobbyist astronomer and part of the Minnesota Astronomical Society. So I was able to go observing with him throughout my growing up um, and et cetera. He also makes sure that every time we travel somewhere where there's an interesting astronomy uh, destination, we make it there. So when we road trip to Disney World, we also visited the Kennedy Space Center and we met um, the astronaut uh, John Fabian. And then when we took a road trip to the West Coast, we stopped at Kid Peak Observatory, which we actually saw in the video tonight. So um, I, I owe a lot of my interest in astronomy to my dad. Um, so what led up to NASA? Well, um, various projects here at the U of M. Um, I'll just go over them very briefly. I don't have very much time today, but I, my goal through undergrad is to try to find the area of astrophysics that I'm most interested in. So to do that, I'm trying a lot of different areas. Um, and freshman year, I started off by approaching one of my professors who was a astrophysics professor, uh, Larry Rudnick. And uh, I asked him if he had any projects that someone with zero experience could do. And he said, go ahead and take the Python programming class and I have a project for you. So I ended up writing him a program in Python that could take a bunch of data and do a lot of calculations so that we could make some uh, conclusions about the interstellar medium. The more uh, aesthetically pleasing part of this project was um, I got to make these images where we superimposed the radio jets of a galaxy. So this is something a radio telescope would see in the red here on top of the visible image. So something that we would see with our eyes with a telescope or Hubble telescope sees. Um, so you can see in this particular image, there is a central bright region of the galaxy. And then there's these jets coming out. And we were able to make some conclusions about the interstellar medium through that. Uh, then I've also spent some time on the University of Minnesota Small Satellite Research Lab. It's um, completely run by undergrads, but we do have faculty and grad student mentors who kind of guide us and review our process. Um, so I started out working on the detector team there on our first satellite, which was Socrates. And Socrates actually launched through a NASA program um, this past spring in February uh, on the ISS. So unfortunately, we never established contact with Socrates, but we're learning from that experience and building, uh, currently we're funded to develop two more, tele two more satellites um, that will be hopefully ready for launch in 2022. Um, also, I did a undergraduate research opportunities project where the U of M gives me a small scholarship 
to present, um, actually propose, conduct and present uh, a research project. And for that, I worked with Dr. Pat Kelly in the astrophysics department to um, kind of, it was another programming project and we were uh, trying to figure out how to program these motors in this telescope so that they would be able to slew or move very fast to a region of the sky. And that's because the idea is that it will take a signal from a gravitational wave observatory and um, point to that region of the sky where the gravitational wave event happened and then look for an electromagnetic counterpart of that event. So that would be like if there was a neutron star merger, we could actually see with visible light um, the neutron star merger happen. It's just the problem of knowing where to look at the right time. Um, and this project is actually on the U of M research fields right over by the Bell Museum. So you can look for that next time you're at the museum. Okay, so more on NASA. Uh, last fall, on the very last day that applications were accepted for the spring internships, one of my friends showed me this opportunity and said, hey, you should apply. And I said, that's not enough time. And she said, no, it's okay, you can do it. Um, so I applied and a few weeks later, I was notified that um, I was being offered uh, a project at the Goddard Space Flight Center. I said, all right, thanks, sign me up <laughs> um, after a little bit of deliberation. And I actually didn't know where the Goddard Space Flight Center was. So I provided this little map on my presentation here because many of us associate NASA with Kennedy Space Center in Florida and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California, but there really are a lot of different locations um, around the US where NASA is located. And I was over here at Goddard, about 30 minutes out of DC. Okay, so now for my actual project. It has a very long title, like most scientific papers do. Uh, the predicted net flux versus pressure profiles during a probe descent into Uranus's atmosphere. So we're gonna break that down. But first of all, I want to say a few words on why NASA is interested in the ice giant planets or Uranus and Neptune. Um, first of all, if you're unfamiliar with the term ice giants, that means um, these two planets are far enough away from the sun that they are actually composed a, um, quite a lot out of ice as well as their gaseous atmospheres. Um, so that's why we call them the ice giants. And we know, relatively not very much about these planets because the only time that we've been up close to them is with the Voyager 2 flybys. So they weren't even um, a dedicated Uranus or Neptune mission. It was just a flyby by your, um, Voyager 2, which has now left our solar system. And those were in the 80s. So anything else that we've learned about these planets since then has been done through distant Earth observations from telescopes on the ground or telescopes orbiting Earth. Um, and this is kind of concerning because the, they're actually the most populous class of exoplanets that have currently been discovered. So every time a new exoplanet is discovered, we can kind of make some conclusions about how cold it is based on how far away it is from its sun or how big or small it is. Um, and we've figured out that many of the exoplanets match the class of Uranus and Neptune. So now we know why we want to go to the ice giants, but um, my project in particular was working with a science team who is developing a net flux radiometer, which I'll henceforth refer to as the NFR, um, that will actually drop through Uranus or Neptune's atmosphere and take measurements as it goes down. Eventually it will get crushed um, and melted in the intense heat and pressure at the center of a planet. Um, but it will be sending science data back as it falls. So this cartoon here gives you an idea of what's going on. Um, first of all, radiative transfer is the science that we're, is happening. Um, and that's just the subtraction of the incoming radiation from the sun. So light that we see, UV radiation that uh, burns our skin in the summer and such like that minus the outgoing infrared or thermal radiation coming from Uranus or Neptune themselves. And from that, and looking at um, areas where light is kind of absorbed or emitted by different molecules in the atmosphere, we can make some conclusions about what molecules are there in the atmosphere, how much is there, what's their, um, how are they flowing, 
why are there storms happening on Uranus or Neptune and stuff like that. So you'll see this cartoon shows the NFR. It won't really have a parachute. I'll show you a better picture of it on the next slide. Um, dropping through the atmosphere and it's looking, it's slewing back and forth, looking up and down at the incoming and outgoing radiation um, and taking measurements as it goes. Notably, there are seven different spectral channels that this instrument can look at. So that just means seven different bandwidths of light. Um, and my project was actually to determine which wavelengths, which bandwidths of light would be the best to look at for Uranus to learn the most about what is in the atmosphere. So again, you can see the instrument here. It kind of rotates along this axis here, rotation axis, and there are seven different channels here. So those channels will be determined by different filters. Um, just like telescopes, we have um, solar telescopes that have certain filters that prevent our eyes from being damaged by looking at the sun. Those are blocking out certain wavelengths of light. The same thing is happening here with uh, our seven spectral channels. So how did I make these conclusions? Well, I was using a simulation program that was developed um, by a collaborator with NASA who lives in the Netherlands. Um, and what he did is took data from the uh, radiative transfer model developed at Oxford and loaded it in here as this spectra we're seeing. And then he actually interpreted what the NFR instrument would be seeing based on the numbers that my science team had available. And I was actually able to analyze what data we'd be seeing from the NFR. And what I wanted to see was that this green line, the noise background, um, was much lower than the signal, these orange and blue lines. Um, I was able to look at a bunch of different parameters to kind of make sure that we could see the most information in each direction, such as the solar elevation angle and um, the angle of the NFR itself. And then this green line is showing you the bandwidth that we were looking at. Um, so the results were that I actually found out that the proposed parameters for the NFR were maybe not the best. And we in, uh, increased the field of view of the instrument, so like the aperture, how much light you're letting in, to 10 degrees instead of five degrees. And that gave us um, a lot more resolution of signal, as well as increasing the integration time. So this, these two plots show the combination of more integration time and more um, uh, field of view. And I know I'm coming to the end of my talk, so I'm gonna skip through. Um, I also did some work with uh, computers and in the lab. Um, and I'd like to take some questions. Oops, that's not what I want. Well, I have a question for you, Meredith. Yes. What, what was your favorite or what was the most memorable, and memorable doesn't have to be your favorite, um, part of your NASA internship for you? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I had a lot of favorite parts, but I think what was the best was just walking through the hallways every day and seeing scientists that are that I'm reading about in the Sky and Telescope magazines that I'm reading about on uh, news articles, um, talking with them, having coffee with them, as well as attending, you know, seminars and talks that just occurred on a regular basis um, with those scientists. And one more before we switch over to Andrew, because I don't want to... Um... I want to make sure he has a bunch of time so he can tell us about his stuff too, yeah. is how, like, what do you think about being able to work on a project for planets that we don't know much about and you're here working on it and, you know, proposing how to find out more about it? How, what, do you, what was that like? Um, it was a learning process. I hadn't realized exactly how neglected um, Uranus and Neptune were. And so now that's kind of my new uh, goal is to spread awareness of that. Um, so, it was, it was really interesting because all the, the most information we have about it are these simulations, like I said, Oxford developed. Um, and so it was kind of interesting to be able to be part of the process to make those simulations better. So yeah, so you're, you're part of the team that is going to make the mysteries of these planets a little less mysterious. Well, thank you for sharing your experiences with those, both projects here on campus and then your exciting NASA internship last semester. So thank you, Meredith. Yes, thank you, Sarah.
So we're going to switch over to Andrew here. Um, Andrew's working on a completely different project, but equally as exciting, I think. Um, so I'm just going to turn it over to Andrew. Go for it. All right. My name is Andrew Serene. I'm a student of aerospace engineering here at the university. I'm also minoring in entomology, studying insects and how they work. Um, I have a long standing interest in both of these things. I, I decided when I was five that I wanted to be an astronaut. That was my goal. And that is still my goal now. It was never a dream as it is for a lot of people. It's a goal and it's something that I can reach someday. And part of that goal is, uh, is Mars. I would like to reach Mars. And I think that a lot of people would, uh, would like to reach Mars soon in, uh, in the near future. And uh, so when I was at the U, I, I got in touch with, uh, with the entomology professors as I was learning about bugs. And I got in touch because I had the idea for this project. I was, uh, was gonna do an undergraduate research project that I got a scholarship to do. And uh, so I wanted to do a project. And so I got in touch with the department head of entomology, Dr. Sujaya Rao. And she was my mentor for this project, which I call the Martian Entomophagy Project. And so I'm gonna share with you a little bit about uh, how, that, how that project goes. And so the Martian Entomophagy Project is, uh, is related to eating insects, which is entomophagy, and Mars. So just to show you guys uh, that I'm, I'm not all talk, this is a picture on my screen of, uh, of what I had for lunch on Monday. You can see some, some nice beans, some collard greens, and some mealworms that I cooked from my project. It's a nice balanced meal. And I think that uh, what, I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm trying to figure out a way to farm insects on Mars because insects are one of the only animal protein sources of food that can be farmed reasonably on Mars. So there's, uh, this is kind of the path that I see towards, towards getting this done, is insects as astronaut food. I'll tell you why that's important. And then how I'm developing it through iterative design, my engineering process, applying my engineering knowledge to this entomolog entomology project the, uh, and the path towards actually doing it in space on the moon and on Mars. So insects as astronaut food. Insects are, are really nutritious. They're, they're like meat, they're animals, and uh, they, uh, have just as much nutritional value, if not more, than, than things like beef and chicken. But they do it for one-sixth of the feed mass. So you feed an insect, uh, you feed insects a pound of, of grain to get the same amount of insects that you would need six pounds to feed a cow for. And that means that they're really mass efficient, which is good for sending them on spaceships. And they can live in small spaces, cramped together, they don't really care about being in, uh, in, a, in a spaceship. So they are a prime candidate for a food source on the moon, on Mars for extended human stays there. There's a lot of research being done on food production for space, for the moon, and uh, it's all on plants. Even though the, the importance of insects and the significance of insects is academically recognized, there's very little research that, that's been designed on how to actually do it. How, to, how do you farm insects in space? How do you make a box, a box that does the thing? And that's what I'm here to do because I have the aerospace engineering knowledge. I have the background in basic entomology and I have the willingness to cook and eat the food that I produce for my project. And those three things together are something that's very rare. And so I've always thought of this project and I've always thought, if not me, who else is gonna do this? Who else is going to kickstart the, the basis of Martian cuisine with insects? So I'm doing this project. I, am, uh, I started farming insects uh, this last summer in my kitchen 
base, I was doing it basically alone and have been due to the, uh, the pandemic, the plague. And so I started farming crickets and mealworms in storage bins, plastic storage bins that I bought from Target. And I did it in my kitchen at home. And I measured the, the, uh, the water and food that I was putting in. And I was just kind of getting a hang of how to farm these insects because I, I've never really bred insects before to, to a large scale. And I found that the mass requirements are gonna be pretty good. I think that you could probably carry, like lift all of the food that you'd have to bring for the insects that you would use to, to farm for yourself for a thousand days on, on Mars, for a thousand day trip. And that's longer than you'd probably spend actually going to Mars and back. So I did that project and now I'm continuing my work through something that we call iterative design in the engineering world. And that's where my engineering knowledge comes in because if you're an astronaut and you've got a farm with bugs in it, you don't want those bugs getting out. There's a lot of requirements for how to build something that goes in a spaceship. And I know some of these requirements. I've been reading the NASA documents about the rules for sending something to the space station, how big it has to be, what shape, what kind of materials you can use, uh, all, the, all those kinds of things. And I've been applying them to my design of this box, which you uh, should be able to see in the bottom left of my screen, a, a 3D model of something that I'm going to laser cut and, and make a box out of. It's gonna be an automated farm. I've got a bunch of computer components here in, in my apartment, and I'm gonna use them to make a box that automatically feeds and waters the insects and collects data about when it does it so that I get scientific data on the fly and I don't have to spend as much time caring for the insects myself. And I should be able to get a lot of, uh, a lot of food out of there. Now, I, I started out with crickets and mealworms. I think I'd actually like to switch the crickets to cockroaches because crickets are very territorial. They fight amongst themselves, they'll eat each other and they're prone to parasites. So they're not, they're not easy to farm, especially in a small, scale, uh, a small scale. But cockroaches are more social, they're more nutritious and they're less prone to parasites and they're cleaner. They, they, they really do a good job cleaning themselves. So even though it's much more of a challenge to convince people to eat cockroaches because of cultural barriers, I think it's worth the challenge. And I think that showing people myself eating insects, I want to normalize this because if you can make a box that is totally sealed up, totally secure, can farm insects automatically and, uh, and efficiently, if you have a box like that, that's like 18 by 22 inches, uh, that's something you could just put in a home in a home on earth and have people eating insects on earth. And that's also really, really important. You know why? Because the way we eat meat now, the way we eat beef, uh, cows, we farm them, uh, it's not sustainable. In 30 years, there's not gonna be enough land on earth, on the planet earth to feed all of the humans that are here that are here in 30 years. So we have to eat more insects. And I feel that by increasing the availability of insect food, by making these boxes available, scattering them throughout the cities, which is kind of more the way that I think that food production should be done in the future. It should be more localized and done in the cities and in, in greenhouses and boxes. If we have insects available through that, we can, make it more available. And if it's more available, more people are gonna try it and realize that it's, insects can taste good. They can be part of good meals and good balanced food. And they have, uh, it'll reduce our dependency on beef and pork. And reducing that dependency is, is important. We're not gonna cut it out completely. Nobody's gonna completely stop eating beef uh, we don't need to, but we need to reduce that dependency and eat more insects, make it a part of our diet, something that we eat along with, with the rest of our food. So that's what, uh, what this project entails for, for people on earth. So I'm, I'm doing this design. I'm trying to figure out how to, to build this box so that I can start farming insects autonomously and doing it more efficiently. And when I start doing that, 
I'll look at the design of the box. I'll look at how it's doing and I'll, I'll improve on the design continuously, iteratively on, in steps until I get something that can be sent on a spaceship and sent to the moon, which I think is going to be a possibility around 2028. I think that's the sort of time frame as, as we're developing these, these rockets, reusable rockets, giant rockets like the, the Starship that can send hundreds of tons to the moon, to the moon's surface. I think we'll be able to build a base at the South Pole of the moon where, where there's a little bit of water ice inside of the craters. And that'll be a good spot for astronauts to stay on the moon for longer periods of time to develop these technologies. How do we re, uh, grab the water out of the ground on an alien world? How do we farm on the moon? How do we, how do we make a greenhouse that works there? And I think that once we've got a greenhouse with some plants, a little bit established there, we figured that out a little bit. Once that's happened, I think that uh, we'll be ready to start sending insects there. And uh, that will be a good time to start working on that, to actually send insects to, to try this out and make insects a food of space and of Earth. Sarah, I can't hear you quite right now. Thank you. My microphone has a separate mute on it. I forgot to click that. Um, but we have a, uh, thank you for that. Who, who would have thought space and insects in one project? Um, but we've had some interesting questions come in. Um, one question is, do you get full when eating insects or would there be um, other food resources needed as well? Um, the, uh, I haven't produced a lot of insects, but you absolutely can ha have insects that are enough to, to be like, like a portion of a meal or like a snack, like enough that, uh, that you could absolutely get full eating lots of insects. Uh, but it's definitely, it's absolutely intended to be in combination with all the other food resources. Astronauts on Mars are going to be growing corn. They're going to be growing wheat and soy and, and beans and rice and, uh, and, and tomatoes and lettuce. And all of those things are just, the insects add variety as well. When you're stuck on an alien planet, uh, an alien desert planet for, for ye a year, you want to have some variety in your food. That is really important for, for your mental health as well. And insects are a part of that as well. Okay, so you mentioned moving to cockroaches. Have you eaten one yet? And if so, what does it taste like? I have not eaten a cockroach yet. I hear they have a, a woody taste, uh, but I have eaten a variety of other insects. I've eaten crickets, which have kind of a, a nutty or earthy taste. Uh, they, of course, they live in the earth, so they taste like the earth. And uh, mealworms have a taste that's similar to sunflower seeds. I think if you think about something that, if you think about a food that would be good with nuts on it, I think that mealworms would be also taste good on it. Okay, we have time for one more question, um, but there are a few more that are in the chat or in the Q&A box, excuse me. So after this one, if you are able to stick around and answer the few other ones that are in the oh, yeah, email inbox, we'd appreciate that. The last question for you. Is NASA already incorporating insects in the meal plan for astronauts, or would this be completely new to them? No, uh, NASA has not added any insects to astronauts' diets yet. Um, the research that's been done on this is, all, is pretty much all theoretical. There have been some experiments in China where they actually farm some mealworms. Um, of course, China has a little bit more recent cultural history of eating insects. Uh, but as far as NASA goes, there's been no research on designing this farm for, for farming insects in space. That's what, that's what I am doing that's, uh, that's new that I'm trying to do. Okay. Well, thank you, Andrew and Meredith, both of you, for your time here this evening. It's wonderful to hear what some of our, the graduate or the undergraduates here at the University of Minnesota are up to. Um, there are a few extra questions in the Q&A box. If, any, if anybody else has any more for Meredith or Andrew, please put them there, and um, hopefully they can stick around and answer yeah. some uh, questions via text there. Around. So thank you both. Awesome. Thank you, Meredith and Andrew. Um, it was so great to have you uh, share your projects. Andrew, I don't know if you know this, but I'm an entomologist by training. And so I love that uh, 
insects are taking over our statewide star party. If you could stop sharing your screen for us and so we can um, bring up another slide, that's awesome. Thank you. Uh, we, uh, I want to take a moment in between um, our segments here to express our extraordinary gratitude to our many partners around the state who have worked so hard to make this virtual statewide star party a success. I'd like to give them a final shout out by name um, on this, our final evening. So in alphabetical order, I am gonna give special thanks to the Arrowhead Astronomical Society, Bellwin Conservancy and Bellwin Outdoor Science, Como Planetarium, Ely Public Library, Farnsworth Aerospace Pre-K-8, Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College, U.S. Forest Service, the Girl Scouts River Valleys, Globe at Night, Houston Nature Center at Trailhead Park, Minnesota 4-H, the Minnesota Astronomical Society, the U's Minnesota Institute for Astrophysics, the Marshall W. Allworth Planetarium at the University of Minnesota Duluth, Minneapolis Community and Technical College, Minnesota State University Moorhead, the National Park Service, Space St. Croix, Three Rivers Park District, and Voyagers Conservancy. Thank you. I also want to let folks know that the Bell's free virtual programs like those during our week-long statewide star party are made possible through the generous support of donors like you. Each time you make a gift of any size, it expands the museum's ability to ignite curiosity and wonder on site and online. If you're interested in making a gift, please visit our website, click join and give at the top of the page or follow the link that you see there. Uh, we'll post that in our, our chat box.